So yeah, I want to talk about what we know about the impacts of climate change on birds. And I want to start with probably one of the more um, obvious or immediate impacts that come immediate to mind, which would be a change in range or distribution. And there's a, a beautiful summary of a very in-depth, pretty thorough study, or actually group of studies, that is at this website, the National Audubon Society, that focuses on North America. So let's start with somewhere closer to home, North America, and predicted or expected changes in the range and distribution of birds in this area. And as it says here at this website, this has relies on, or is based on information compiled by not just scientists, but um, people who like to bird watch and the information they've gathered. And it's been put together to show how, again, the ranges, distributions of birds in North America are expected to change under the uh, projected warming scenarios, or the most common one that's, that, that's used. And let's start, and one of the beautiful things about this website, it has a very nice visual uh, interactive feature. We can look at the whole continent, or you can look at state or province. So let's start with New York State, since that's where we currently live. New York State is in what we call the Atlantic Flyway. We can divide North America into these four spatial regions running east to west, west to east, called flyways, where that meaning you have, uh, these are the pathways, principal pathways through which birds migrate. And when we do that, and type in, or click on New York, so that's where we're here. What we see, and of course, any state click on a region, you would get a list of bird species and what is shown with each bird species is the amount of summer range in terms of area that, expected, that they're expected to lose in North America as well as the winter range. So, first of all, let's explain that about birds. Most bird species, I shouldn't say most, Many bird species spend the winters in areas different from where they spend the summers. Not all. We have some bird species that will stay year-round in the same area. So they have it broken down here into summer range and winter range. What's particularly important about the summer range to keep in mind with birds is this is the time of year that they're nesting, when they're raising young, producing offspring. So this is very important uh, if you had to, so to so speak, pick, uh, pick between the two in terms of a fort. It's not that winter range is, is not important. So, as I scroll through these different species and look at the amount of summer range that they're expected to lose, or range that they're expected to lose, you know, if you pay particular attention to the summer range, it, it's very startling, <laughs> the magnitude of these. Now, they have them sorted by highest to lowest, but you can see that there's several species. You're up in the 90% of the amount of summer range they're expected to lose by, of course I have to qualify this, by what time, you might be asking what time frame and under what scenario, I'll get to that in a minute. But as you scroll through here, you know, you're getting down to some that are more in the 80s and 70s, but still, you've gone through a lot of birds where you're still well over 50% of their summer range they're expected to lose. And again, what's really nice about this website, this interactive feature, you can click on any one of these species, let's do black throat or green warbler, it will present you with a map of North America and what it does is track the changes that are expected in their range from 2000 all the way to 2080 under the current uh, emission scenario where there's no significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And you could do this with any species and you could see as an example, the representative, the, the, the major change that happens in the range distribution of this particular species, of course, what you expect is that it's shifting northward. But maybe what's interesting is how far north it's shifting and how you're losing a lot of the nesting range, again, summer, so nesting uh, area here in the continental United States, you know, completely disappearing. The other nice thing about these maps is another graphic they show is these circles down here, which shows you. How much overlap there's expected to be between the current summer range and the expected summer range in 2008. So the way this works visually is the more those circles overlap, or I'm sure it's maybe say it the other way, the less those circles overlap, the more uh, different obviously those ranges are and what we consider less stable. So 
much less of their current range would be habitable by that species and much more would be expected to be elsewhere. So stability is equated with this graphic with overlap. And when you look at a lot of these species, there's very little overlap, very little stability. So it's expected that the ranges, the point is, are going to change dramatically, not just significantly, dramatically, shifting northward quite a bit. And maybe more important, that much, if not most, much if not most of their current range will no longer be habitable. So what about, so that's North America. What about the Northern Hemisphere extended to that? So not just the Western part of the Northern Hemisphere, North America. What about Europe and Asia? So here's some data showing that what is happening in other parts of the world, so we have the United Kingdom, we have Finland, part of Scandinavia, so obviously that's in uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, in the northern part of that. But then we have, again, North America that I showed you, both breeding ranges and winning ranges. And what this graphic is showing you is that this is the mean northward range expansion. In other words, how much, in terms of kilometers, the range of these species of birds is moving northward per year, okay? And if you look at the magnitudes of values, we have one, one and a half, two. That may not sound like a whole lot, but one, two kilometers per year. But again, when you add that up over several decades, that's a significant uh, change. And they even give you the time periods in which these studies were conducted. So we have a 20, over a 20-year 20 period, 12, 26, 30. And what's really interesting about this is that this is actually what's happening now. This isn't predicted. What I showed you before is what's expected or predicted based on our best understanding information. This is what's happening now. Birds are already shifting their range northward, at least in these parts of the world and most likely in other parts too that are being currently studied. Another graphic that shows that nicely is this. If you just focus on the right-hand graph right now, this is plotting, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. This is from a study done in Hungary uh, looking at Changes in ranges from 1969 to 2007, so about 40-year time period. Okay. So Hungary's in you know Eastern Hemisphere, but in Northern Hemisphere, Europe, Central Europe. And if you look at the graph on the right, it says the y-axis says change in FAD. FAD stands for first arrival date. So first of all, these this is focusing on birds arriving in the spring, and it's looking at how much earlier they arrive in the spring. So the lower that value, you get the negatives that's um, earlier from the baseline, which is zero, is at 1969 when the study was started. So it's showing you, if you look at all those dots, that um, the majority of them, if not most of them, are be below zero, so they are arriving earlier than they had 40 years ago. And in some cases, again, if you look at the values of that, you see it, it says minus one, minus two, so that's in days, that's one day, two days, over 40 a period, and that's important to realize is the magnitude. At first you might say, okay, so they're arriving a day earlier on average, or two days, oh, how big of a difference is that? So what? Is that really that important or significant? We'll come back to, to that in a minute. If you look at, well, let's, let's go and address that. So if birds are expected to shift the range northward and they're already starting to show that and arriving earlier, one could easily think, okay, well, then they're adjusting, they're adapting to climate change, and so there you go. They're just moving northward. They're, they're, so you have some type of mitigation of any potential negative impacts. So what could be so problematic uh, with that? The problem is there, there are a lot of problems associated with that. First of all, there's only so far north you can go. <laughs> if you're already a bird, that nests or summers in northern latitudes, like the subpolar or polar regions, there's no further north you can go. <laughs> and of course the poles, both North Pole and South Pole, are experiencing the greatest degree of warming around the Earth more than any other regions. Even if you're not a bird that nests that far north, but a little uh, further south, you're potentially blocked by unsuitable habitat in terms of expanding a range. If you're birds that nest in I don't know, this part that we call the tiger boreal forest of Asia, or even here in North America, you're blocked by the Arctic Ocean. That's, it, that's un unsuitable if you're a land bird. Not only that, but if you're a bird that nests, I don't know, in deciduous forests further south, you're potentially blocked by a different type of habitat. 
So you're being forced northward into habitats that, at least currently, you're not adapted to or are able to, to, to live in. One may say, well, well, would you expect the vegetation to change as well? That's going to migrate northward. northward. There's studies looking into that. But at least the, the studies that have been done so far I've looked at are indicating that that's not going to happen too fast, that these ranges of the birds would be expected to expand faster and further north than what the vegetation can move to keep up. So no, they're not necessarily still going to be in suitable habitat. Habitat's not going to move with them at the same rate. It's starting to look like that's going to be the case. Not only that, but you also have altitudinal issues. If you're birds that nest at higher elevations uh, or spend your time, whether it's winter or summer, but again, particularly nesting part of the year is, is, is critical, that as you have a warming climate, you're having these zones and mountainous regions creep upward, just like you have that latitudinal shift, you have an altitudinal shift. So if you're a bird that nests you near know, tops of mountains in this type of habitat, that's increasingly going to become uh, smaller and smaller, right? Smaller uh, elevational band. There's no, if that mountain, you know, is only that high, there's no further higher you can go. So we're starting to see that, that in the expectation prediction is that species of birds that nest in, on mountain tops. And it doesn't have to be really high mountains. We're seeing this in mountains even in the eastern United States that their range is being squeezed into a narrower and narrower band. So there's that problem too, or being blocked in an elevational sense. Not only that, but if you go back to this graph, and now if we look at the left hand panel, well even the right hand graph is showing the same thing, but it's even showing it more looking at the data this way. What they've done is take the same, this is data from the same study, same information database, but they divided these birds, these migrant birds, what we call short distance migrants and long distance migrants. Short distance migrants, as it, just, as it says, they're spending the winter not terribly uh, far away, by that I mean uh, could be 100, a couple hundred uh, kilometers away, well it could be even more than that. In North America, where I'm more familiar, short distance migrants are those that spend the winter in the southern United States. So birds you might have here in the summer, you could list a whole bunch, um, that you may not, you won't find here in the winter, but where they are is in the southern United States. And then they return usually or on average before what we call the long distance migrants. In contrast, long distance migrants are spending their winters much further south in the tropics and subtropics. Again, here in the western hemisphere, they're spending their winters in Central America and in Northern South America. So they're much further south. And we're seeing this distinct difference between the change in arrival dates. In other words, what this is showing you is that short distance migrants are returning earlier, right? kind of uh, tracking, maybe not tracking is the wrong word, uh, but in but responding to our springs uh, happening earlier, right? Our, uh, the onset of spring is, is occurring earlier of the past, uh, especially we look at a 40, 50, even 100 year um, interval, they're, re they're returning earlier, but the long distance migrants are, are not, okay? either are not at all or, or much less so. And that's really interesting. It's not really that big of a surprise when you understand the cues they use, birds use to know when to return to their summer grounds. A lot of people think it's temperature based, and for some birds it is, particularly those that are short distance, they're using a warming weather as a proximate immediate cue to say, okay, now it's time to go back to where I spent the summer. If you think about it, it makes sense. Long distance buyers don't use that cue. They're in areas where you don't have major seasonal changes in temperature. You can have changes in precipitation, maybe a little bit of temperature, but that, the cues they use are photo period, the amount of daylight there is in the day. That's not changing. That stays constant. So their cue's not changing, so there, there's no reason to expect them to return earlier. And they're not. Is that problematic? Yes, in a big way, as you might think. If you think about it, if you're not coming back sooner when spring and keeping up with spring happening earlier, you may miss out on major food sources. And a lot of research is starting to show that now. So the schematic figure is showing that, that you know, it's got a lot of lines on here, it looks pretty busy, but if we break it down, we're saying, okay, if this is a situation before significant climate change has occurred, we have, uh, during the season that these birds are nesting, we have the period of time where they're laying eggs. Well, first of all, they're arriving on their 
breeding grounds where they nest. They lay their eggs, those eggs hatch into nestlings, and they feed their nestlings. Studies show that that's, in most of our songbirds, that's timed pretty nicely and closely, the hatching of their nestlings with peak food abundance, particularly caterpillars, but, but other kinds of insects. No surprise. But if you think about it, what happens with when you throw climate change in and global warming is that you are getting a shift in many of these birds, particularly short distance migrants, as we said, that they are starting to return a little earlier and they are starting to lay eggs earlier and even raising nestlings earlier. But the shift in the food uh, base is happening much earlier, so you get the situation where it's now out of sync, that they're having uh, their nestlings and having to feed their nestlings at a time when it's still after that peak food abundance and thus may not be able to provide enough food for their nestlings. This has been a, a, a prediction or a, a concern on the part of our biologists and now studies are starting to, to come out to show that this is already happening. Here's one with some North American birds. This was a study that was done with was it 49 species of, 48 species of songbirds and they were to show that in nine species already, they're documenting this mismatch and shift. So for example, this Townsend's warbler, very pretty warbler, nests in the western United States, that this is, uh, and this is what's most remarkable to me, the time frame of this is from 2001 to 2012, just a 10 year period, and fairly recently. During this 10 year period, in the areas where Townsend's warbler nests, the plants now green up 2.7 days, uh, has shifted, uh, oh, that's, that's in fall. But the birds arrive 0.4 days, okay? Later than what you expect them to keep up and that you have this mismatch of 2.5 days per year. In other words, they're not keeping up with the leaf flush and the consequent um, increase in insects. And here's another species, you know, they have this documented for many of these species. So, this birds arriving a little bit earlier, plants are, have shifted much earlier than the birds are arriving, so you have this mismatch now of a day per year. So it's not a day total, but during this 10-day year, you have one day per year on average. So when you add that up over the decades, that's significant. So there's several days now where they're not keeping up with the shift in food abundance that's occurring earlier. And there's data now coming out with species in Europe. Two species in particular have been studied pretty um, closely and significantly showing that this is happening. What's nice about this study is they started documenting this and having information from 1980 comparing that with today. There's a lot of information on this slide, a lot of curves. If we break it down, we can see what it's showing. That if you look up here, back in 1980, here's your date that the eggs are laid, the date that the eggs hatch, and that they're feeding the young. Again, that's pretty well matched with, oh, what they're showing here on the curve is this is when the food is needed the most to feed those nestlings. And it happened that 1980, that coincided quite nicely when you did have most of the food um, out there available. Now, what you're seeing is that peak food abundance has shifted significantly earlier, about two weeks in a uh, 20, 25 year period. Birds have shifted too, but only by one week. So they're now out of sync, not mismatched. They're not having young early enough to catch that peak food abundance. So they're missing out on that. And studies are showing that, that that is showing up in health status and growth rate of the nestlings. They're not as healthy, they're not growing as fast because they're not getting as much food and as nutritious food. It's not just insects, which corresponds closely with leaf flush, as we said, when trees, plants start producing leaves, but also flowers, as you might expect. Uh, a lot of data showing that flowers uh, now bloom much earlier than they used to. We have two different locations here, Massachusetts and Wisconsin, and we have some um, data going way back. So over here, all the way back to 1850, the average date at which flowers bloom. Of course, there's a lot of scatter because we have a lot of different species that bloom at different times. But then when we go to current, we can say that has shifted almost by 10 days. Flowers bloom earlier by 10 days on average over the past 150 years. And over here, shorter time frame, 75 um, to 100 years, but again, you see the shift in, in, over this time frame of five days. Flowers are blooming five days earlier. Is that important? There are many birds that do feed directly on flowers, namely, particularly one group, hummingbirds, 
feed on the nectar flowers, and it turns out, again, it's kind of no surprise, that that's a very important food resource for them while they're migrating and they're returning to their nesting grounds during spring migration. They feed heavily on nectar. They time that with peak flower bloom. Flowers are blooming earlier. The question now is, are hummingbirds adjusting? Are they coming back early enough to time their uh, appearance with this peak flower bloom? Studies are starting to come out that that's not happening. They're missing that peak flower bloom. It's not just birds that feed directly on the nectar from the flowers, but flowers are also uh, a, a habitat, if you will, for insects. A lot of insects, pollinators come to flowers, that's a food source for different kinds of birds. So it's not just, again, the leaves on trees, but also the flowers that are uh, flushing, blooming earlier, and that's having uh, a change on the amount of food that's available to these birds during a time when that's very important, when they're trying to feed offspring. And it's not just here in North America, but just to show you, you know, I've been focusing on that so far in this talk. But there's concern, there's studies being done in other parts of the world, like the tropics, that climate change and global warming is also having effects there, particularly in, um, in higher elevation areas. And there's a particular type of habitat in Central and even South America called cloud forest, which turns out to be really interesting and, and somewhat unique. Uh, and at one particular location, Costa Rica, where I was fortunate to spend a little bit of time in Monteverde, they embarked on this very um, in-depth, comprehensive study looking at the impact that climate change there has on hummingbirds. And again, you might say, well, in the tropics, it's always warm there, so how could global warming or climate change be affecting um, climate patterns there? What they're finding already in Monteverde is it's becoming drier, and this is very important cloud forest. Uh, the amount of moisture they get drives a lot of the seasonality and abundance of food and, and, and processes within the ecosystem. So this is a concern over the fact that it's drying out and becoming warmer, how that's going to change the timing of flowers blooming, of insect flushes, how that might affect all the um, various hummingbird species there. It's a very, very high diversity of hummingbirds, which again, time there. Uh, nesting and parts of their seasonal cycle very closely with blooming times of flowers and, and um, other phenological events. So we have shifts in ranges that are expected to occur, already occurring, and why that's problematic. Just having overall reduction in amount of uh, area that's available in habitat. We have this shift in synchrony or phenology, right, that birds are um, arriving not soon enough to take advantage of peak food abundance. There's other impacts that we're seeing of climate change that are a little less direct. And if you look at specific types of habitats, uh, that's fruitful to look at how climate change is affecting those particular areas. One particular, again, in North America is what we call the prairie pothole region. If you're not familiar with that, it's this region in the Midwest United States and Northern States and into Southern Canada where you have, they call it the prairie pothole region because first of all the native uh, habitat type is prairie. Obviously that's changed or been altered dramatically significantly to agriculture now. But what exists there are many, many small wetlands, just like little ponds, okay, that are a very important breeding habitat for waterfowl. Most of the species of our ducks and geese here in North America, most of their population, not just the majority, most of their population, breeding population, occurs there. That's an area of high productivity, area very important for, the, for them in producing offspring and sustaining their populations, because until that habitat alteration, that was ideal habitat. Not just waterfowl, but also some other types of non-duck birds that are wetland birds, like spent marsh birds. Okay, so very important habitat. And how climate change is expected to affect the prairie pothole region is summarized pretty nicely in this slide. So you can just focus on a couple of the phrases in here. It's expected to change the availability of water. Okay? The plant communities that make it up. Here's our timing again affect the timing of seed production, insect abundance, important food sources, 
And the overall conclusion of this study was that climate change will likely diminish the capacity of this region to support these wetland-dependent birds. So there's a lot of concern about um, those, these types of birds in, in this region. How about coastal regions? Sea level rise, definite consequence of global warming and climate change. There are species of birds that nest principally on um, shores, sandy shores, beaches. For example, the piping plover, which is already a nice cute little plover that's threatened in New Jersey. Actually, it's in Dane, New Jersey. I think it's still at the threatened status in New York State. That as sea levels rise, you're going to get continual erosion of that habitat and loss of that habitat for those birds. So that's of concern. It's not just the beach habitat out here along the shoreline. When you look at a, uh, the natural state, uh, the natural habitats that occur along coastal regions, you find that behind this foredoom, we call it, in the back dunes, you usually have these uh, bodies of fresh water, these small ponds or wetlands that are very important again, or even bays, they don't have to be fresh water, I'm sorry, they could be estuaries and back bays that are salt marshes, that are areas of very high productivity and that support a lot of bird life, that water level there is going to increase. There's concern that that's going to change the types of plant communities that you find there, which again are the base of the food webs, and that there's going to be a change and the amount of food that's available for birds that spend their time here. And not just nesting, I've been emphasizing that, but these are actually also very important as wintering areas, it's what we call staging areas during migration for a lot of seabirds and water birds. So that's going to be affected. There's also expected to be effects of what we call saltwater intrusion. As sea level continues to rise and erodes this coastline, you're going to get this um, seepage of saltwater underground into freshwater aquifers, underground pools of water, and that also provide surface water in little of these logs. So not only is this water more um, away from the shoreline going to become, uh, you know, the, 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 is, is going to rise, there's going to be change in plant communities, but it's expected it's going to become saltier than what it already is. And that's going to have impacts. More indirect impacts of climate change. How about effects through um, invasive species, droughts, uh, phenomena like that? Climate change is expected and is already, again studies are showing, is changing the range and distribution of pest species, for lack of a better term, um, organisms that affect other organisms in a negative way. And there's all kinds of examples of this. I thought I would use this example since, again, it's close to home. And I'm not sure if a lot of people are familiar with it. But there's um, an exotic invasive pest called the woolly adelgid. It's an insect. It came from Japan. It's been around for several decades already in the northeast United States. I'll show you a map in a minute. They're very small insects. They actually don't move hardly at all. They appear as these powder puff white spots on hemlocks. They are a new pest of our eastern hemlocks. And we have some really nice stands of eastern hemlocks here in southeastern New York State, as well as many other areas. And we're finding out, or studies have shown, are very important habitats for a lot of different organisms. They're somewhat unique communities. They're different in many ways from the surrounding deciduous forest. And many parts of New York State and other parts of northeast United States, these adelgids have, have, have um, grown into outbreak levels, and they're killing off the hemlocks. And they do it rather quickly in terms of the lifetime of a tree be little as 10 years, you're seeing hemlocks die from being initially attacked from really delicate. You get to the point where you have vast areas that didn't seem to come out very well. But you can see the all the hemlocks here, the gray, are hemlocks that have died, have been completely defoliated. They've lost their needles from really delicious, have died, and you have these large patches of hemlock forest. And a lot of researchers are documenting how that's changing that ecosystem and the animals that inhabit or depend on that ecosystem and they're no, no surprise finding changes. So how does climate change play into this? Well, as you might expect, and again a lot of research is showing with a lot of um, insect pests, what we consider pests, that they're expanding the range northward as global warming occurs, particularly what seems to be critical for a lot of these species.